we human beings are amazing creatures. Uh, we've come a long way in a relatively short time when you think about it. Uh, 10,000 years ago, we all were living by hunting and gathering. And today, here we sit in this uh, wonderful theater using advanced technology to uh, talk about very complicated things together. Uh, how, did, how did this happen? How did we manage to uh, come so far so quickly? Well, <clears throat> the first thing to understand about this is the, the, the basic rules of the game, which is that energy determines biological success. Uh, all animals obtain their energy from secondhand sunlight, either from plants or from eating other animals, from food in other words, and exert energy into the environment by way of muscle power to get what we want and what we need. But the crucial factor in all of this is net energy. In other words, it takes energy to get energy. It takes energy for the fox to chase down rabbits. But the fox has to get some kind of energy profit out of the deal, has to get more en energy from eating rabbits than it takes to chase them down. Otherwise, no more fox pretty soon. And it's been the same for us. It's been estimated that uh, as hunter-gatherers, we, we had about a 10 to 1 energy profit ratio. In other words, it, it, for every unit of energy that we invested in getting energy, we got about 10 units back. And what did we use that extra energy for? Well procreation, singing, dancing, having a good time, all the things that human beings like to do. So we need an energy profit, and we've managed to get an increasingly large one. We've managed to find ways of harvesting ever more energy from our environments. One of the main tools that we've had at our disposal for doing that is language. Language is a powerful tool that's given us uh, enormous leverage over other animals. How so? Well, language enables us to coordinate our efforts and to plan ahead in ways that we could never do otherwise. Other, other animals, in fact, all other organisms communicate through various ways, through chemicals and scent and, and gesture and color, endless ways, but human language has such, abs such incredible abstraction that we're able to use really just a few symbols. I mean, when you think of the alphabet, just a, a, a few, a few uh, verbal sounds and a few marks that are able to communicate an amazing array of meanings. And that has given us enormous social power. Also, of course, we have tool use to leverage our muscle power as we apply it into the environment. So using language and tools, we've gone through several energy transitions during our time on the planet over the last few tens of thousands of years. The adoption of fire, perhaps up to 200,000 years ago. Agriculture, more like seven to 10,000 years ago. The domestication of traction animals. Human slavery actually was a way that we had for a very long time of leveraging our muscle power for the benefit of the few. And the development of ever more sophisticated tools from horse collars and plows and gears to, to computers. All of, all of those energy transitions built upon one another until we got to the most recent one, which is the Industrial Revolution, which really should be considered the fossil fuel revolution because it wasn't just about inventing new machines, it was about finding a source of energy that was so concentrated, so convenient, and so cheap that it enabled us to do unprecedented things. It was as though we won the energy lottery. Whereas before we'd been using secondhand sunlight, now we had access to ancient sunlight stored up over millions of years that we could extract and use over the course of just a few decades. Using fossil fuel energy because it was so concentrated, so portable, 
we were able to make tools with a life of their own. In other words, machines that carried their own energy supply. This was, this was something really amazing. Uh, uh, perhaps the first horse in a town with, a, with its first uh, 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 electric, uh, or it, its first uh, uh, railroad or first automobile must have responded with surprise and, and, uh, and fear. But the first people to view this, this was the very first steam engine, the, the rocket, Stevenson's rocket back in 1820 or so. The first people to see this thing were equally fearful and amazed. This was magic indeed. And so we've, we've looked at tools, uh, powered tools, powered machines, as if they were a kind of uh, magic, able to deliver goods and solve problems in a way that uh, uh, is, is almost uh, awe-inspiring. We've even created tools with a mind of their own, self-regulating machines and powered calculating machines. These things are always getting smaller and cheaper. They're more useful, but also more intrusive. They, they keep track of us. And of course, just as machines are doing work for us, increasingly, we spend more and more of our time looking after our machines, in effect, serving them. This chart shows uh, energy consumption per capita in different eras measured in kilocalories per person per day. As you can see in the Paleolithic era when we were hunters and gatherers, we were using very little energy per capita as compared to when we developed agriculture. But what results is a kind of J curve, you see, that just the last couple of hundred years, the per capita energy consumption has skyrocketed. Well, here's another similar curve. This is world GDP per capita. GDP, of course, is gross domestic product, the amount of money that changes hands in an economy. And lo and behold, it follows energy use very, very closely. And then here is one more measure of biological success, simply world population. There were fewer than a billion of us at the time of the beginning of the fossil fuel revolution. Uh, two billion by the 1930s, three billion by the 1960s, four billion by the 70s, five billion by the late 1980s, six billion by 1998, and now it's something like 6.7 billion of us. This is definitely a biological triumph for a, a large-bodied omnivore like us to achieve that kind of power over our environment. But is it is a kind of perilous success because, of course, it's based to such a large degree on the extraction and use of non-renewable resources. It really doesn't take a genius to be able to tell that this is kind of foolish behavior to base your entire existence on the extraction and use of materials that aren't being produced anymore and that are going to be gone in a relatively short time. All the way back in 1972, the uh, Limits to Growth group realized this and published their study. This was, of course, was the first attempt to apply computer modeling to resources, population, and sustainability. And sometimes when I talk 